two writers. One just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, welcome along. We've been in launch mode, so we're um, hopefully not looking too ragged <laughs> and wearing the same clothes we always wear. That's how we are. Uh, yes, welcome to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Uh, delighted to have you here. We have a huge interview for you today, um, which looks good in video as well. So if you didn't, haven't been to our YouTube uh, page, and you want to go, I think probably of all our interviewees, we've had the best looking sets, haven't we? Oh, yeah. For today's interview. Nicest house award goes to Holly. Yes, Holly Ward. So H.M. Ward, who uh, is an inspirational author for uh, those of us in the indie space. Uh, she's prolific. She's brilliant. Uh, she works hard. She's a lovely, lovely person and a requested uh, author interview. So we've chased her down a bit. She was nervous about doing it, really nervous, and doesn't do interviews very often, but she was the most relaxed and interesting interviewee we had. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, probably you and I are not necessarily a demographic for her books. Don't be so presumptuous. Well, no, but that's not to say that there aren't men who read uh, romance books. Um, but she's in... We've mentioned this before, and... Um, it's something that uh, that I learnt uh, when I started reading some of the craft books that you know women are the uh, the consumers of books more than men, and uh, that's why some of the biggest names in our indie space are authors primarily aimed at women. And H M Ward is somebody who's got that sorted out. So look, we're not going to ramble on. I am rambling a little bit. We're not going to ramble on too much, but it's a great interview. We'll have a chat off the back of it. So here is H M Ward. My name is H.M. Ward. I'm a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today bestselling author. Um, I've sold about 13 million books since I self-published in 2011. Yeah, very impressive. Now, I can't remember from my um, questionnaire whether I call you H.M. or call you Holly. Do people call you H.M.? Holly. Holly. Just call me Holly. Okay. That, that works. I know some people work with initials, like C.J. Craig. <laughs> Okay, look, um, you have you have sold a ton of books, Holly. A very, very impressive um, back catalogue, and you're quite a prolific writer as well. So I'd, I'd like to explore a few areas with you. But first of all, uh, let's just start the origins of the H.M. Ward story. When did this all start for you? Um, I started... Okay, we have two starts. First start was Rough Start Children's Books back in 1999, early 2000. Um, I was an artist first, love painting, um, a children's ministry, theology background, so anything to do with kids, totally I was there. And so um, basically I had made a bunch of children's picture books and had done the traditional query, try to get it published method, and after about 18 months of slamming my head into the wall, gave up. Um, and so... <sighs> things have a way of repeating. And so after having a few other jobs and doing a few other things, I went back to writing and art because that's what I like and that's who I am and it makes me happy. So um, 2010, um, I had wanted to change career direc directions, go back to something that was creative. I had just had a bout with um, owning a shop, which was a total nightmare, dealing with retailers, vendors, blah, um, not for me. Okay. <laughs> Retail and creative people, at least for me, they don't go together. So um, anyway, I wanted to do something creative again. And, you know, writing's cheap. You need a pencil, computer, something, stuff you probably already have. Painting's expensive. So <laughs> I went back to writing. And um, basically, I hadn't written a novel before. I wanted to see how long it would take me. Um, I'd been spending a ton of time on business message boards. I had business stuff just, yeah, self-taught from having... Uh, we had a photography studio and then from having a boutique after that. And so it made me wonder how long it would take to actually write a novel. So if I took all my focus and attention that I've been putting into these forum posts and put it into a book, yeah. So um, I wrote my first novel, which was a teen paranormal romance novel. Um, and that took about three months from start to finish. Um, and that's that's probably the longest it's taken me to write a book. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing and I was bouncing all over the place and it had several rounds of, oh my God, overhaul of revisions, throw that out, restart. And um, anyway, 
Um, and then, so that was 2010. Um, I researched the market like crazy and uh, considered traditional publishing. I had actually gone, was going down that path. Um, uh, didn't have problems getting an agent. They had started to shop my manuscript. And the more I got into looking at self-publishing, the more I realized that avenue is definitely more for me. Um, and, what, and so what was I kind of... What about that that made you realize? Um, I had, fr from 10 years of being self-employed and having my own business, I knew a lot about marketing, advertising, um, uh, Facebook, social media, at just how to connect directly with fans. And um, at that time, they were called people. <laughs> yeah. And so um, anyway, but I, I knew that from having the other businesses and I was good at it. And that was actually something that I'd been uh, helping other business owners with. And so... Um, Anyway, when self-publishing stuff came up and I found Joe Conrath's blog, which was like a godsend because, you know, he tells it like it is and you have all this information and it's just right there. And so, um, and that was at a time where he was like pulling away from traditional publishing and Amanda Hawking was going into it. And so there was this, you had both sides where they were right in front of you and it was easy to see. And so, um... But just uh, from watching and reading the discussions that were going on about it um, and then the feedback that I was getting on my, my book while it was, um, you know, being shopped and suggestions and it seemed like I'd end up writing a book by committee, which wasn't really appealing to me. Um, no. <laughs> and so, um, and then uh, I've always wanted to know, you know, more about the traditional publishing, how they go about marketing and what they do. And... Um, from having a small business for 10 years, I had uh, developed a lot of um, different marketing techniques that work really well. And basically I wanted to see which ones they were utilizing and um, they weren't really utilizing any of them. And so, and what they were doing was very antiquated where you're talking over a decade ago where it just wasn't working now. And I knew that from firsthand experience, even though it was a different industry, that that form of marketing it's a lot of money and you're kind of just taking a plate of spaghetti and throwing it out the wall and hoping something sticks. And I still don't like that kind of marketing now. And there's a lot of it out there. And so um, anyway, I decided to take my book and publish it on my own and see what happened. So um, the first book, uh, the first month I sold a few hundred copies um, and then it just took off from there. Um, numbers are a little fuzzy because we're about seven years past that point but um i think it was about around the 12 month mark that that first series had sold its first 10,000 copies which was mind-blowing to me um i knew that first hurdle to get over was going to be selling past selling more than 200 copies i thought you know that's usually the lifetime sell-through rate on a book so that was going to be the first major barrier and so i broke through that the second month that it was out wow. and so it was a lot of intentional planning and just attacking it like like a business and so you have the really cool creative art side of things and then you have the business side of things so i mushed them together and it worked out well yeah so this first book um just tell me for a moment when you said you wrote it over three months, was this all you were doing? Were you, were you working, writing no. five or six um, hours a day or was this? No, um, I, I wasn't. I was writing usually towards nighttime. Um, I had, I was working full time. We owned a, um, a boutique photography studio at the time. So I was working full time doing that, uh, homeschooling two, two children. And I was pregnant and writing a book. Wow. <laughs> so um, it was it was something I wanted to do. So in the beginning, it was just see if I can do it and see where it ends up. And writing's cathartic. And I like that part. So writing the book wasn't the hard part for me. And in your mind, the reason you were looking at writing and moving into writing, apart from the fact that you thought you might enjoy it, I get the sense from the beginning, this was a business decision for you. Um, it was a business decision. Um, it basically, I was hoping to, I never expected it to get this big where it became primary income and didn't need the photography studio. Um, about 18 months after I published my first, self-published my first book, I was able to close the photography studio, which was incredibly difficult because we built it from the ground up. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that place. And it was very successful. But the book, self-publishing, became a lot more successful where if I put my time in there, I'd have 
more time period, more time with my family, more income, more latitude, more career longevity, just everything. Um, and so, yeah, for a long time, so for the first 18 months I was self-publishing, I was working basically two full-time jobs because I was writing my books and I was still working at the photography studio. Yeah, so the fact that you you saw it in business terms, in terms of um, being successful and liberating your life and so on, probably informed the way that you looked at the traditional industry. And I think that's interesting because a lot of people, when they start off writing, don't really know the difference between the two, haven't explored it. And so inevitably we'll sign a traditional deal because that's kind of what's presented to you and that's everything mm -hmm. you know. So what I'm interested in is how you went from running a photography studio, writing, to being in an empowered position to say no to traditional publishing and choose the indie route. How did you discover all that? Um, a lot of it was hours and hours and hours of research. Um, making informed decisions is a huge part of being successful at anything. Um, and so when I didn't have that opportunity the first time, and I know the internet was there in 1999, but people weren't really talking about self-publishing. It wasn't as big. The people that did it were, it was still vanity publishing where you had to pay. The, you know, the platforms and the way to upload and directly uh, connect with the readership wasn't the infrastructure wasn't there yet and so um so that first time around i did my research and had my my guides and thought i did a fairly good job figuring out what i needed to do and where to submit and it looked appealing for picture books um and this time around basically i went back and went i'm going to find out everything i can about this and the more uh, articles and things that I read about and just blogs because you have people online talking about everything and so anything that you want to find out about publishing is there um, and so basically I took that information and um, I, I made a business plan with it um, and also incorporated my lifestyle and what was going on with me and our family's needs into it which was um, really important at that time um, and 2010, I was pregnant. We had a mm, baby surprise, unexpected third oh, child. Okay. Um, and so uh, my older kids were a lot older. And so um, anyway, that, that, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, so I wanted to make sure, you know, we weren't completely poverty stricken. And <laughs> things were kind of going that way because I had, I was accruing incredible, tremendous financial debt from medical bills. Um, I was getting sicker and sicker and they couldn't figure out what was the matter with me and it took a long time and there was a lot of different things going on. Um, but at one point they had told me I'm not going to be, I shouldn't be here now. So they had pretty much told me you have five to eight years and so, um, and that I had a terminal illness and I had found this out right when, um, right, right before the baby was born. And so that lit a fire under me to go. I'd been the primary breadwinner before then. My husband does the books and does uh, things that are black and white and is really good at them. But in terms of um, creativity and selling and sales, I excelled at that. And so um, basically we figured out our relationship and we always had, it, it works really well for us. And so, but um, for the photography studio, the last few months we had it open, I couldn't stand up anymore. I'd shoot a photography session and then I'd go straight to the to the hospital because I needed, I needed help. I couldn't stand. Um, I was incredibly exasperated with that too, because again, we built that from the ground and I was going to have to walk away from it. Um, publishing specifically self-publishing allowed me to earn a living from a hospital room or from a bed, wherever I was. I didn't have to stand up. Um, if I had insomnia, I could write at night. I didn't have to physically be anywhere. Um, and I know there are a lot of people that have uh, medical problems where, you know, they may be looking at it for extra income or something like that. And and it, it, it can be helpful with that. And honestly, that, that was a huge life-changing event for us because I thought I had, uh, basically I made a five-year business plan where at the end of the five years, I'm out of the equation and I'm not here. Um, the interesting part is I'm still here right? yes <laughs> like seven oh, years later I was so, gonna ask but <laughs> yes I, I was misdiagnosed and um the uh problems that I was having uh there were several of them layered and so I've had like three surgeries now and I'm doing a lot better and 
yeah, so not only did I get my life back, but I have this huge career, too, that I didn't expect to be here for. So um, anyway, it's, it's funny how things work out. But when you... Um, I think when you're stuck in the daily grind and you're like, you know, because a lot of people are working another job while they're trying to write, especially in the beginning where you're trying to launch some kind of career. And it's hard and it, it takes a lot of time. And so people, one of the things that they ask me all the time is how the heck can you do all this stuff? Um, you know, with, I mean, even now or being sick and raising children and homeschooling and work and just everything. And um, a lot of it is putting on blinders for what doesn't matter and what can wait. You know, if you think you're not going to be here in a few years, it kind of makes you focus. Yeah. And so um, the trick is to keep those on now that I know I'm okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, it makes you utilize every minute you have and not spend every single second working. And so um, back in 2013, when I thought I wasn't going to be around very much longer, I worked like crazy because I thought... Um, I basically couldn't do anything, so I was stuck in bed anyway. Um, and so my husband was taking care of the family and the kids, and I felt like I can contribute my part to the family by providing as many books as I can so that they would have royalties to live on after I'm gone. And so um, so I wrote like crazy then, and it was cathartic too, and I needed that outlet um, because I wasn't very happy. <laughs> And either stuff kind of sucked so which is weird because I had tremendous success with career and tremendous uh just life was horrible you know actual life and so um it's interesting how things kind of come and go like that so um yeah the uh the hidden blessings of a terminal diagnosis who would have thought yes. that there was, know, a, right? there was that upside that I never said I ever noticed before? Yeah. But the it's way like, what can you do if you <laughs> have no time left? And apparently it's a lot. So Yeah, it sounds like the plot of a novel. Yeah. So, uh, so there you go. Um, now, I, on, talking about plots, let's, I, again, I'm, I'm interested in this start, and we'll talk about your, your later books in a moment, but Paranormal Romance was your genre choice at the beginning again was that a business decision or was that something that you thought was inside you and wanted to write um my favorite genre to read is uh young adults paranormal romance with dystopian elements um and so that's why i had started there um it was more see if i can even do it um i knew a lot of people started to write novels and never finished them and so i wanted to pick something that i know i thoroughly enjoyed and um the idea of crafting a world um, intrigued me too. And so it had layered creative elements to it that I just, I really, it was attracted to it. So that wasn't so much a business decision. Um, I didn't know how much of a market share it had at the time or anything about that. I basically knew it was a genre and I liked it. Yeah. So I started there. So. And then as you started writing, I mean, how many books have you published now? You said, so you did say at the beginning, but. Uh, now I have. 95 96 is about to come out so yeah incredible productivity but you're you have quite a few series within that yes i do um so i i stuck with the teen paranormal for a long time and as i started to read uh market share information um and this is stuff that uh carries over from having a physical business is you need to establish who your market share is um and what you can actually what's achievable and so um at some point numbers started to make it very apparent that even if i was at the top of the uh young adult paranormal romance dystopian crowd it's like this big yeah. it's not that big <laughs> and so it's gonna have a low ceiling um compared to if i was writing something that was a much larger crowd like um like just general contemporary romance um which that was a pure dis business decision to move over to that genre um and so when i first did that i didn't really know what would happen because at the time i had an established uh readership with the teen crowd and the paranormal people and i really didn't expect them to follow me some of them did which was awesome a lot of them didn't because it wasn't their thing and um anyway so it was like starting over and so the first seven books that i put out 
did like nothing. Um, I remember being incredibly frustrated and the people that read them left really good reviews and they liked them. I had some blunders with covers and um, where I chose ones that I thought were pretty and that I liked because I don't really like traditional romance covers. That was really dumb. <laughs> and so I fixed some of those mistakes and that was pretty much what, uh, what made the difference at the beginning of 2013. Um, my first... Uh, my debut romance book was Scandalous, and that was the first book that hit a list, um, and that was January 2013, and it was right after I changed the cover from what I thought was pretty to something that was specifically contemporary romance, and okay. it started the ball rolling. Yeah, sometimes you have to kill your babies, don't you, and, um, and take a, <laughs> a pure business decision rather than what uh, our, our instincts aren't always right on these things, right. and that's, that makes a good business person that you are prepared to take the advice at some point mm -hmm. um so productivity how often do you write how do you approach this and how much are you writing at the moment um right now i have a bunch of different things going on um and so productivity for writing um i'd like to say i sit down and write five 500 words every day I, that doesn't work for me um i tend to get uh I tend to go in bursts where um, I really feel like writing and I have to write and I have so many words inside of me and they're dying to get out. And so it's much easier and better to write when I feel like that than than to do the methodical everyday method. And so that's been a recent change. And so um, I'll sit down and write. It, sometimes it's a few days. Sometimes it may span over a couple of weeks. Um, it's basically until that, that urge burns out. Um, and so if... I'm in that zone and in that mindset, I average about 2,500 words an hour typed. Um, if I'm doing dictation, it'll be a lot higher. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so a slow day, 500 words where you just have to pull them. That's what I, I stopped doing that and uh, switched to more of a when I feel like it. One of the big things that has helped productivity a lot has been realizing that um, for creativity to come out, creativity has to go in. <laughs> and so, because um, for a while I was sick, I couldn't go out, I couldn't do stuff. Um, a lot of the creative input I was getting was, um, you know, computer, TV, other books. It was very limited. And so um, uh, I like going to the theater. I like plays, culture, music, anything like that. It's uh, museums, especially. Um, anything where I'm coming into contact with other artists and stories and where you're in a situation where you can experience life and so um, I've increased th that amount of experience and it really makes writing a lot just easier and fun and uh, it doesn't suck the joy out of it because at some point and I felt like that and I know other people have too it just um, it starts to feel taxing where you're like I just don't have words and I can't write this right now and um, at those times for me, it's been where I have had absolutely zero uh, creative creative stimulation or input. I haven't seen a movie or a show. I haven't done anything in a while. And so um, this year, one of the things that we've done is I'm intentionally taking breaks at times of year where I know I go into full workaholic mode where I'm like banging my head against the keyboard trying to get words out because for whatever reason, it's repetitive and it seems to come at these specific times of year. And so I'm removing myself from the equation. So that sounds really weird because basically I'm saying to increase productivity, you should work less. Um, that seems to be what, what <laughs> actually helps with me though. And so, um, yeah, so more, more creative stimulation uh, definitely makes words flow faster. Yeah, and, and you say when you're going well and you are enjoying it, you're doing two and a half thousand words an hour, did you say? Uh-huh, yeah. So you can do a book in a week if you're... Yeah, yeah. So that's, I, I have that first debut uh, romance book, uh, Scandalous, was written in six days. And part of that too was I had just um, uh, come across the nano site and I was like, a book in 30 days? That's ridiculous. And so I just wanted to see how fast I could do it. And anyway, yeah. <laughs> Turns out it was six. 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 <laughs> so I was like, okay, it's not so ridiculous now. <laughs> and in terms of plotting... Is this something you do in advance? You sit there and see to your pants? Um, up until recently, I would have said I, I'm a pantser and did it by the seat of my pants. I don't think that's true. 
um, because I've been thinking about it. I, I'll come up with an idea and turn it over in my head. I'll write down little notes here and there. But basically, it's the idea sits in my head and keeps turning over and over and over again until I've run down every plot line and storyline that I could possibly go in. And then I pick the route I want to go. And usually by the time I get to that point, I'm ready to write it. And so I don't start writing until I have that map and all the characters are defined. I know who they are. I may not know their names, but I know who they are, what they like, what they don't like, and like everything. And so, um, which is funny because I was like, oh no, I just made that all up. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it was sitting in my head for like a year. And so right now on the stories that I'm coming up with that I'm currently writing, they were dreamed up almost 18 months ago, two years ago. And so they're getting onto paper now. And so, and there's it could be partly because there's a backlog of them. You know, with the first uh, romance book um, I wrote, I thought of it over a few days and um, and wrote it down so it didn't have the plot complexities and all the goings on that some of my current works have. So, um, and then just, yeah, taking the time to actually write everything. It's more time consuming, or it feels like it is, than sometimes thinking up the stories. So, yeah. so you say that you, you have them in your head and, and these current mm-hmm. stories go back 18 months. I mean, literally, do you mean in your head or do you write them down somewhere and, and go and look I'll up, write look up down, the notes? And... I'll write down key notes because, like, um, I have a story right now. I'm really excited I'm going to start, and I can't start it yet because I need to finish. Uh, my main series is ending, and it's like I need to finish that one. But in my head, I wrote that, like, two years ago. <laughs> so, anyway, i got to get it on paper. And so, um, anyway, but... Yeah, so I'll write down uh, uh, key keynotes or phrases. Basically, it's a really ghetto outline that kind of clues me in if I forget or forget what I was excited about, because that happens too. Um, and so that way, uh, it'll jog my memory enough to remember where all the everything was connected and what I was doing with stuff. So, Okay, let's talk about marketing for a bit. So in those early days, when you made your decision to go indie, you had your first book, you'd seen in a disappointed uh, way what Trad was, d- was doing and you obviously felt excited about the possibilities of indie. How did you start and what did you start doing? Um, when I first started, okay, a, a lot of people think I'm, I'm very extroverted. I'm not. I'd live in a cave if I could. I don't like talking to people. The fact that I'm talking to you is like, bonuses man we feel very <laughs> we feel very excited that you're talking to us i know right you got me out of the cave uh, <laughs> anyway and so um i'm just not an extrovert and so yeah the whole public speaking thing uh, that didn't appeal to me the traditional side of things they they're definitely they were then and they, they kind of still are now um it, it's very reliant on geography and then um physical stuff and so um i'll explain that in a minute but like with the um with the photography studio we had people flying in from all over the place to come here and uh, physical limitations were one of the things that drove me nuts and so one of the huge things about self-publishing is it it's not physical you're dealing with intangibles and which means you can have a worldwide platform you're not limited by time or space which gives you such a huge advantage, it's insane. And so um, with the traditional side of stuff and, and having to uh, you know, go speak here and physically move around, um, that wasn't possible for obvious reasons too. But also I'm, I'm, I'm like antisocial, that doesn't appeal to me. And so um, the computer, the internet man is like your best friend. And so you can live in a cave and still have a computer. You can um, talk to people on Facebook, but it doesn't have that extra version drain that talking to people in real life does. And it has the global platform without leaving your living room. And so um, I took all those things that we had learned from the previous business and uh, applied them to publishing and basically saw what carried over and so the very first thing I did was to tell people I wrote a book which was absolutely horrifying because they're like oh my god what it's about I couldn't tell people um yeah it was just it was too nerve-wracking and so um I finally told my husband she didn't even know I wrote a book so I was writing a book every night for three months and he didn't know um (laughs) (laughs) I told him when I was done and so um yeah and I told everybody else way later so it was probably 
I think it was about six months after because as I decided I was going to get an agent and I went, okay, if I'm going through with this this time, I'm just going to tell everybody and we're going to do a public crash and burn or a public success. We'll see, but I'm making it public. Um, partly because I knew that would light a fire under me to actually follow through with it and not just go, I wrote a book and then leave it on my computer. And so I wanted to follow it through to wherever it went. And so um, I put up a Facebook page for that book, which was Demon Kissed, and it's still there. It has about 50,000 fans on it. Um, this was back when you didn't have to pay for people to see your business page and um, reach was natural. And um, anyway, that page before the book was even done or I knew I sold it or was publishing it, I was on there and talking to fans and I had fans. That's weird. There's no book. How do you have a fan? They were there. I had fans. Uh, <laughs> and so um, basically we, we talked about stuff that interested that demographic. And so they're... Um, teenagers and um, they like angsty books I got that that's good so do I see we have stuff in common and so um, basically it was a public platform to be able to talk to readers all over the world and get them excited about that book and so um, it'd been so we started six months and then uh, it launched in um, March so the page was there for about nine months before I self-published the book and so by the time I published we had about 20,000 fans on the page 25,000 and um, and that was mostly through just natural growth from talking and people are like holy crap an author's talking on a Facebook page it's like I wasn't even published yet I didn't understand why they were excited but I was okay with it they told their friends and their friends came over and we had a little writing club for teen writers for a while that was that was cool too because they were just very excited and so um but that that gave a platform to spring off of when I started and so um and then in the beginning telling everybody that I was doing it and not being shy about it um which was really hard because like I said cave and not talking to people including my family and best friends didn't want to tell them because failure's scary and um Anyway, but by telling them and putting up the page, it made it real and it made it a tangible thing and it made it a goal that I wanted to do something with this. I wanted to see it through to publication, either traditionally or self-published. Um, and uh, people like to watch either train wrecks or success stories. So you're either the train wreck or the underdog. And that's interesting. And so the first few hundred people came from word of mouth, just from my own social circles. Um, and I had all the stats on Facebook and how to grow fan bases and stuff from, from the previous business. And you have a lot of the same hurdles you have with publishing where, you know, uh, your, your average Facebook user, this was back then, had, you know, 200 friends. And so you had to get past that 200 mark to be able to break into other social circles effectively. And so I used a bunch of that stuff too. But the main thing that's been at the middle of it... Um, because then I would have told you the book's at the middle of it. It wasn't the book, it was me. They were showing up to see what I was going to do. And so that's kind of nerve-wracking, but it worked really well. <laughs> so yeah, That's incredible that you built up a list, well, an, an online audience of 20,000 people just on the idea of you writing a book. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was just on the idea. There was no cover to start with. I just had the title, which in America, naming something demon something or other was just cringeworthy. And so that that I would have said was a marketing mistake. <laughs> um, could have picked a better title. But um, yeah, no, they, they showed up anyway. And so it's and that was at a time where people were going, Facebook doesn't work. You can't use Facebook for businesses. It doesn't do anything. And so it does. You got to figure out how to use it so that it's doing what you want it to do. And in this case, it was to make people aware and interact with them. And that was it. So, um, and when the time came, they wanted to see what I did. So they all grabbed the book, which was awesome. <laughs> wow. And you hadn't collected their email addresses at this point. This is on Facebook. So Nothing. Presumably at some point, it, it, I mean, were you thinking about an email list at that point? Had it occurred to you that you needed that in the future? Or? I knew I needed an email list and I didn't like, uh, I've been on so many email lists that I don't like what they do where I went, I don't want to bother them with that. And since Facebook at the time had direct communication with them where it was very easy to talk to them and then it, you, the, uh, appearing in their newsfeed wasn't a problem so I really didn't go after the email addresses until I had to and so where uh it, honestly it was ridiculously long time until I went after the email addresses and so um 
like 18 months uh, <laughs> after I published. So it was something I knew I should do. Um, and so when I started to do the email addresses, I looked at emails that I get on a daily basis or weekly basis, whatever, the ones that I like. And so, um, and kind of emulated what they were doing. And so that that's very few and far between, you know, emails that show up where you're like, yes, it's my Disney store one or something from, you know, a photography boutique or, you know, that that's the exception. And so the goal with the newsletter initially and still is to be that exception where people are excited to see your, your email. So yeah, the email list started late. But I'm Start a, your email list sooner. Yeah, I'm assuming you have a pretty <laughs> healthy email list now. I mean, in fact, I imagine because you had yes. your audience so warmed up. Uh, by yes. the time you yeah, now, before even published, so they're transferring them to email was probably relative, were quite right. successful, I imagine. Right. The email list, um, for me, they're, they got there after they read a book and so um, instead of before. So I know that method for me is a little backwards too. But um, I put the uh, text to sign up information at the end of the book so that way if they're um, – on an e-reader, not on a tablet, uh, clicking the link is a problem. So that way they can just text. And most of my readers that are on that email list did text to sign up. So the bulk of them, it's like 80, 90% of the list texted to sign up. So that was also a huge turning point for me to actually collect those email addresses. Mm, that's, a, um, that's a really good tip, isn't it? So people text, uh, how does the system work? Your email address to a number? Um, it's automated. I believe MailChimp has it now too. I'm still using constant contact. I know that's funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, but they have the text number and the whole thing's automated. So constant contact grabs their, it prompts them through it, asks for their, um, email address and puts them on the, whichever list I, uh, said they should be on. Yeah. And so, um, that way I'm not involved in that aspect of it. Um, I also, for marketing, I do have uh, direct to cell phone texting services also. Um, it's a lot of people ask me about that. Um, cause I really think that's going to be the, the next thing is going to be getting to them, not, not through email where you still have buffers and barriers and spam filters and Gmail classifying you as promotional crap <laughs> so that they don't see you even if they wanted to. Um, but yeah, I think everybody has their phone with them all the time. And so I think it's going to be uh, interacting with them um, either through an app or through texting where it just makes it easy for them to remember you're there and get whatever new book you happen to have out. So um, I've been doing the texting service for about a year now. And so um, it's a lot more expensive than the email service. But if your list is good, it can easily pay for itself. So yeah, yeah we're just trialing an app at the moment and... Um uh, yeah, the idea of the notification having mm -hmm. more impact and more immediacy than an email or, or text even probably. Right. So, yeah, that's definitely one that we're looking into as well. And some neat little things you can do with apps. Uh, you probably, mm -hmm. wanting to live in your cave, don't do public events very often. But if we turn up somewhere, I noticed you went to uh, LBF last year, didn't you? Um, yes. And I don't know if you're going this year, are you, Holly? Uh, not this year. Okay. But you could, for instance, set up this alert so anyone who's got your app, as they arrive in this geographic area, mm -hmm. get a text that you're there and where you are, etc. So sort of things you can do with apps, which are we're just, just starting to look at. But I think you're right. Um, not everyone gets emails. In fact, we know just from our business, we'll send an email out with a bit of important information in it. And three weeks later, people are emailing us <laughs> saying, why doesn't this work anymore? So, well, because so it just shows right. how many people don't actually get the email. So. Right. Yeah, well that, we have an app too. I've had it for about a year now. And so we've been uh, considering different ways to, to use it. At first, I had been thinking that we'd put the uh, my ebook library on it because a number of my fans, especially because I have shorter works, are reading on their phones. And so um, until we figure that out, make it uh, their stuff with marketing and um, – not marketing, but with, with ROI, the way that it uh, – you know, if you have an iPhone, it's still going through iBooks. And so um, – using apps that are still using the iBooks apps, it doesn't doesn't get around that. So you don't get a bigger profit share. And then you end up with product that is not as good as the iBooks app. And so um, finding things that integrate into the Kindle and iBooks app has actually been, has been good and it still looks nice and goes into the library the way they like it. So um, the the app, I think, is, is the, the new thing, the direction things are going in, that and texting. So yeah. Good. And in terms of today, so you've got your list now, which I'm assuming is pretty healthy um, uh -huh. um you you communicate with your list are you advertising on social media doing facebook ads at the moment or not 
Um, I do Facebook ads not too frequently. Um, uh, right now, actually, uh, I'm running Facebook ads on the Kickstarter. We are making a film. Woohoo! Oh. And so, um, yeah, do you know what? Did, I'm not sure if I told you anything about that. Um, but the as the arrangement series concludes, we've um, it's 23 books long. That's been a fan-driven series where the fans were interacting and uh, giving me feedback on the storyline and actually helped shape the storyline and certain characters. Um, it's about three years since it first started, and um, even though it's been fan-driven, I kind of went, let's wrap this up. <laughs> and so this is the last book. And um, while all this stuff's been going on, um, we've been trying to shop around to find a film home that's appropriate for it. And the subject matter is a little bit dark, and so it kind of, uh, okay, it's very dark, so it kind of freaked a lot of people out. And so um, after a lot of talking and a lot of near misses where we got people excited and then they're like, this character's too dark for us, we need to lighten him up, um, been talking to the fans. And since it's a fan-driven series, I will, you know, we decided to do it together. So the Kickstarter is going on now, um, and if you want to see what crazy authors can do when... They feel like it. It's at uh, pharaohmovie.com. Um, we put it up to uh, to commission the script, the screenplay, and so we hit that goal. And basically, we're gonna roll right along with that until um, we get the whole movie made. And so um, that's going on right now. And the arrangement series is concluding. And so Facebook ads. We were um, they're going to be running on the series once it once it concludes and then they're running on the Kickstarter right now because that's been one of the main problems with Facebook in the past seven years. I've been doing this too long. Um, <laughs> is that they, um, yeah, the fans don't know what's going on. Communication's been cut off. And so um, unless you pay for it, they really don't see it. And so uh, being uh, thrifty with, with ads is helpful. And so, um, and getting them to, to be involved and to know what's going on is, is yeah, it's necessary evil. Um, so, yeah, well, the film project's fascinating. So, you know, executive producer of your own film here and trying to yep. get it going. You're going to go out to somebody else to write the screenplay. You didn't fancy a stab at that yourself. I took a stab at it myself and then went, I want it to be a really good screenplay okay. and not, not a debut screenplay from, yeah, no. So, um, yeah, someone that has a lot of experience is, is doing that. Not me. <laughs> and how much... I'm, I'll have to look at the uh, the details. I don't know how much in Kickstarter normally you specify all the amounts that you're going for. So, right. So what are the, you looking um, at raising here? The initial goal was um, about eight thousand dollars, and so um, so it's not not too much, but it's a significant chunk. Um, and so right now we're just shy of eleven thousand, and um, I told the fans that I would pledge match them up to fifteen thousand. So uh, if it's at 11 now, then we're at 22. Okay. So, yeah. which is a healthy chunk to kind of get stuff rolling. Yeah. I mean, beyond that, it can get quite expensive making films, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it can. So um, I have everything all mapped out because I'm like OCD like that. So I know exactly what we need and when. And um, and part of the fun with this and, and with the, the arrangement series, and it sounds nuts to go, you wrote a series with, it was open-ended. Um and I allowed fans to shape the storyline. And so it, it's, it's, it was kind of insane. But I went, it worked out really well for the series. I liked the challenge. Um, so like the, the entire arrangement storyline wasn't mapped out in my head. A bunch of it was made up as I went. Basically, I had brackets for certain books. And when I finished one of those mini brackets, I went, should I keep going? And they were like, okay, yeah, let's keep going. And so, um, and so I made another one and extended it and they kind of got to choose which directions we poked into. And so, um, I know it's not quite orthodox to involve fans the same way in um, a film production, but I really want to try to, so we'll see what happens. Well, that's really exciting, really exciting. Your um, energy level is incredible, um, and also <laughs> I can tell your focus and organisation. Um, so it's uh, from the outside, you look at somebody who's been so successful as you have, and you think, well, what's the magic ingredient? And as we always discover on this podcast, do you know it's not magic, it's organisation, it's uh, it's it's as you said at the beginning, making good decisions, informed decisions, and just doing all that stuff right. And uh, wow, you're really inspirational, Holly. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you should come out of your cave more often. 
I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we're so grateful that you've spoken to us. We've been rattling on for coming up to 50 minutes now. So um, I'm going to let you go. Remind me, are you in Texas? Yes, I'm in the middle of Texas. Okay, I can see that glorious... I am a native New Yorker, in case you're like, what is up with that accent? So, (laughs) yeah. I can see that glorious sunshine outside your windows, and we're in dreary, (laughs) cold England at the moment, but um, it it (laughs) feels feels lovely. Um, Holly, I I hope you'll come back and speak to us again, maybe in a year's time. We'd love to follow the film project. We've got a um, podcast episode uh, from where I'm sitting now, which is, where are we, Uh, coming towards the end of January... I think in a couple of weeks we're doing an episode just on what to do when Hollywood calls, how not to panic oh, cool. and uh, who you speak to and how you how you behave on those. So we will have done that by the time this interview goes out. But here's a whole new way of doing a film. You don't need to go to Hollywood because you are. Yeah, you've got your own <laughs> Hollywood. So um, uh, that's great. So that's a really interesting project. And we'd love to catch up with you again and see how that's going. Yeah, that'd be awesome. There you go. I told you it was a good set. It's a great set. Yeah, I, I like that house very much. I'd like to think that if we interviewed Dolly Parton, it would have been a similar backdrop. <laughs> I think it would be more rhinestones. More or whatever they are. Um, <laughs> lovely to talk to Holly. I thought she was fantastic uh, and uh, great to speak to. And, um, you know, lots to learn really from her. Certainly prolific in the way that she writes. Certainly disciplined. Um, and, yeah, and she's just been getting it right. Yeah, she's she's amazing. She's a really hard worker. I didn't know the the stuff about her health. That was that uh, was interesting. Uh, that you know, she thought she had a we've all got an expiration date, but she thought hers was a little sooner than might otherwise have been the case. And I'm just so pleased that that's turned out to be not true. Um, but interesting that that was a, that was a good motivation for her to really crack on and and leave a body of work behind. And and now that even though she's got the all clear, she's still working very hard, still um, putting out regular content for a vast legion of fans yeah it's not a bad psychological trick to play on yourself is to think if you were given that that date so you've got 12 months left to, left to live what would you do and do it you know i'm going to vegas yeah <laughs> sorry children you're get, in your inheritance get, get, <laughs> get those books written um <laughs> set up a stable income really really focus your mind and she had that happen to her but um but we should all think I don't want to get morbid about it, but, you know, as you say, we will have an expiration date. But also, just because we're not, you know, a relatively limited time on planet Earth, make the most of it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good um, state of mind, I think, to get into. But she, you know, she's amazing. She's done really amazingly well. And she has, a, as I say, a vast army of fans. And the thing with, with romance um, fans, and there's a reason why romance is the biggest selling genre. There's two reasons, really. I mean, I think it's probably true without being too general about things that women do tend to read a bit more than men. Um, if you look at all across all genres, but romance readers are certainly the most voracious. And, you know, you, you hear plenty of readers, you hear plenty of authors telling me that their readers will read a book a day. Um, so you've, amazing, got, isn't it? you've got that vast, um, that vast readership also reading extremely quickly. There's a big demand for books. And, um, you know, it's not that long ago that um, Scribed or Scribd, I'm not entirely sure how they pronounce that, took that you, you weren't allowed to subs- subscribe to that service for romance books because people were chewing through them so fast they couldn't actually afford to pay the authors. It was it was disproportionate as regards the other books. So a good example there just of how fast those readers get through the content. Um, so if you're, in, if you're in romance or in any one of the probably hundreds of subgenres, um, it's a it's a pretty fertile um, field to be, you know, sewing your your book. <laughs> Let's move on. This is why Let's you don't on. write romance oh, dear, erotic terrible. thrillers. Um, but the sex scenes are great. Yeah. Okay. Um, absolutely. Look, we've got an announcement to make, which is that uh, we've had an idea. When I say we've had an idea, oh my goodness, the <laughs> lights almost, the lights almost went over. <laughs> uh, you've had an idea. Um, which we put into action, and that is to compile. We've had a lot of information, fantastic, valuable uh, information contained in these podcasts, and it takes a lot of hours to listen to them all. So, what we've done is we've created an ebook, and the ebook contains the very best, almost all of them, it's just some of them aren't particularly uh, relevant for the ebook, so they've been taken out. But for most of the podcasts, they're there. You get a description of the podcast, you get all the hyperlinks you need, and then you get a transcription of everything that's happened in that ebook 
carrot, you know, indexed by the subject is a very useful thing for you to have. And you can have it for the, the one price of $99.99 <laughs> every month. No, it's absolutely free. I'm joking. It's completely free to you um, if you'd like it. And all you have to do is to go along to this address, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash vault, V-A-U-L-T, because that's what it's called, the vault. Uh, as I speak at this moment, the final touches are being put to it, so it's possible that you'll go onto a waiting list and get it a week or two later, or it might be available straight away by the time you sign up. But it's there or thereabouts now. Is that your stomach rumbling? Was that, that was, a, that's a lorry? That was a lorry going past the window. And I also should, should point out that page seven of the vault features uh, a new a, a new picture of Mr. John Dyer. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes. Um, so don't let that put you off. No, no. Um, it's, um, uh, uh, warnings are, you know, appropriate <laughs> for that. And uh, yeah, so so uh, selfpublishingformula.com. God, I've gone all funny. Uh, forward slash vault, V-A-U-L-T, to get that. And we'll probably make this uh, an annual or biannual thing and then put those together. So we think that would be very useful. And tell your friends about it. So if people, don't, some people just don't listen to podcasts, right? But this is something you can flick through in your own time. And it's useful to have all the links in there as well. So Good. Thank you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed listening to H.M. Ward. Uh, as I say, an inspirational author, whatever genre you're in, a really, really uh, a welcome guest on the podcast. We've got some really good guests coming up. We've got an anonymous guest coming up in the next few. It's called Data Guy. Can't say anything more than that. Some of you will know who he is, but none of you will know who he really is. <laughs> and uh, until then, you can email us, podcast at selfpublishingformula.com, and you can get uh, all the podcasts on YouTube, our YouTube channel, Self Publishing Formula, or at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll speak to you next week. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.